Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Geneva Checklist, written by Swegler. The scout ship Fragger approached and began a landing procedures with a rogue planet rather far into the depths of space. And while a rogue planet isn't terribly uncommon across the galaxy, this one was. It was an unremarkable planet, average size for supporting life. The faint remnants of a magnetic field suggested it once had one strong enough to blanket and shield life from the harshness of its sun. Strangely, a fine dust coating the planet rather than the typical still and frozen landscape. But what made it stand out was a thick and slowly pulsing red grid orbiting and encompassing the entire planet. Unbeknownst to the crew of the Frogger, they had discovered a tomb world. One that was a memorial and a warning set loose across the stars for people to discover. Scans of the planet revealed that the entire planet was perfectly covered in this fine dust, sometimes kilometers thick, but all bar what appeared to be a medium-sized complex situated at the magnetic pole of the planet. It seemed that the complex had been spared whatever had happened to the rest of the planet, but anything within a five-kilometer zone was perfectly preserved, while well, anything intersected with the border was split cleanly whilst one half joining the dust, and the rest not. From orbit, it appeared the complex was utterly devoid of life, with no electromagnetic emissions or thermal signatures to indicate any activity. But as the landing craft approached the facility, they picked up a weak signal peaking just over the background radiation. The signal itself was nothing special like the crew would expect a distress signal to be, no signs of quantum repeating, subspace or hyperspace distortions, nothing like that at all. Only one crew member feeling a deep unease and scouring the sensor readouts found the signal. Similar to a pulsar emissions, it was simply a repeating set of pulses cast into the darkness. Carefully exploring the complex revealed what while the outside looked similar to any other military headquarters or capital building, the interior had been altered with the walls and floors ripped and forced so that every single route only went to the heart of the complex. In the heart they found a small living space, only fit to house a single being, but not for very long, as indicated by the desiccated remains of an unknown species that still sat at the console long after it had expired. To their surprise, the console did in fact power on when one brave crew member touched the screen, a musical bing, making the exploratory crew glad for the plumbing in their suits. The display was alien to the team, but totally unfamiliar to anything that they had seen before in spite of its apparent age. And after some trial and error, they had figured out how to operate it somewhat to discover that only things contained was a series of video logs and what appeared to be an ability to upload a separate storage medium. Wanting to be out of this place and to get the feck out of Dodge, to borrow the phrase they copied the contents of the console and left, glad that no defenses blocked their aggress to their landing craft, and no batteries blew them out of the thin and still atmosphere. Of all the fragger, the crew decided to upload their findings to the ship systems and try to view what they had found in some relative comfort. This was in part aided unintentionally by some software included within the download they carefully broke into the translator and installed the translation for Uridanish without the crew noticing. Opening the first and estimated to be the oldest file that if the recording date noted from the console was to be believed was around 8,000 cycles ago, they were greeted by the image of a deceased alien at the console, very much alive but not looking much better than they had found it. I am the planet leader Urblat. Last in line of the regimency for my species, Uradranish. But, to be more accurate, I'm the last of the Uradranish alive. I was the leader of my species, and I drove us to the brink of near extinction because of greed and my hubris. My people have been reduced to a single fraction of our own population and replanted elsewhere across the vast universe, and I have been left alive in the ruined capital of our home world to act as a herald by their own tongue. It is my punishment and a warning for those who find me. The crew of the Fragger looked at each other in concern after just hearing the first few sentences from this defeated and sickly being, but decided to press on to see what else the Urblot had to say. 
Ours was a large empire that spanned hundreds of systems, Erblatt started. We were not alone, however, as there were a number of smaller empires that made up the consortium that we barely bothered to join. The largest members were ourselves, the Wabar, the Tyrrell, Pat, Yatar, and lastly, the humans. As the video ended, the Erblatt started coughing fit and reached towards the camera. Surprise swept through the crew at this. They knew humanity just as well as any other species traveling the stars. They were the diplomats, aid givers, and trustworthy traders across space, yet they were surprised to hear them mentioned here. The next video showed Erblot quite worse for wear. Their eyes were bloodshot when purple blood appeared to be leaking from their mouth and what they guessed to be their ears. My folly was believing that humanity was pacifists successfully only in their abilities to trade and make peace. They didn't even defend their own stations and instead hired other species for that task. We thought that they would be easy targets to subjugate in our empire. Slaves make us all richer, but my people and I were mistaken. I started by hiring some of our species pirates to target their more remote stations promising amnesty and the spoils to those who would do my bidding while preventing scrutiny from the consortium. My cabinet loved this idea and followed me blindly towards our doom. The crew of the fragger looked towards each other, but not a small bout of nerves. They, after all, would engage in acts of piracy to make ends meet, and they all knew that human stations and ships tended to be easier targets due to the fact that they rarely, if ever, offered any more resistance than a disapproving look across comms channels. As we expected, the few hand-picked remote stations and frontier stations offered barely any resistance at all, Oblat continued. They gave up their goods and equipment almost willingly, at least to us, which offended the pirates we had hired who decided to commit the second great mistake. Their captains ordered some of the humans shot despite their full cooperation. While the Frogger's crew looked at each other over in confusion, Erblat continued on, but surprisingly ignorant of their confusion. They had committed the crime of killing unarmed civilians, something which we would learn far too late was a nigh unforgivable to humanity. I don't know how, but those pirates were tracked back to us. My government and myself, and despite the surprisingly substantial evidence included, we played ignorant to them. And why wouldn't we? The humans sent us a diplomatic envoy hoping that a physical being would be less easy to ignore for us. However, we ignored them for an entire cycle while the carefully planned raids across human space continued. With each new raid, the humans added that to the evidence that they had on us, and the diplomatic request changed from negotiations to the cessation of hostilities, which we still ignored. Eventually, we decided to blot their envoy out of our skies to stop their pathetic pleas and annoyance. They had just sat in orbit in their pathetic craft, sending their requests for an entire cycle, expecting simple words to work, having been apparently too weak to bring together any kind of force to bolster their claims. This was the third mistake at the start of the war for us. We killed their diplomat who sought peace and made our goals known to them. Captain Grog looked over around at his crew or aboard the fragger, black precipitation forming on their head as their concern grew. Everyone knew humanity was soft targets for piracy, with himself targeting them once or twice when it was that or run out of supplies and fall into the nearest stellar mass. But war. Humanity at best had a handful of system pickets defending their core systems, and while their shields were the best around, Everything surrounding those shield systems were woefully underpowered. How could humanity even wage war, much less to the extent of the apparent eradication of a species? They were pacifists who rarely took in defensive actions, even for themselves. They were the peacemakers of the galaxy. They're reliable traders, not warmongers, far from it, Grok thought to himself. With a considerable degree of hesitation, Grok selected a third out of the five video logs recovered from the planet. Humanity targeted our remote military installations first, and simply destroyed them. 
I still have no idea how, but all we ever found were brief snippets of distress calls and expanding clouds of fine dust where those installations were. Even our secret ones, somehow. Using this chance, I officially declared war on humanity, citing these strikes as acts of aggression. I used their retaliation, thinking it was the doing of common mercenaries, as an opportunity to invade their space. They called it escalation of hostilities, and they were right, as my fleets were redirected towards their system, seeking false revenge, and in response they covered their worlds and stations in shields which glimmered in the darkness of space, like jewels to snatch. My fleet fired upon their stations and planets and found that unless we focused their entire might of multiple ships, we could make no progress against their defenses. But we did, in the end, and attacked with reckless abandon and, to my shame, glee. Grack pondered the significance of this new information, and while outright war is fairly rare in the galaxy, this was to his knowledge how it was normally fought. At least, that was their experience when offering their services during the occasional civil war broke out. With the payback remaining undisturbed, Urblatt continued on after drinking some last drinks of what appeared to be water, the speech clearly taking its toll on the obviously weakened being. While my fleets assaulted their stations and planets, the humans continued to broadcast what seemed like an obvious bluff. Cease your hostile actions or we will be forced to defend ourselves. We ignored them, thinking that they were obvious bluffs from a weak race trying to buy time for hired mercenaries to come to aid. But we were, of course, wrong. Once the first projectile, plasma lance, beam, or whatever hit their hull, it no longer matters what I do and do not know. They defended themselves. Behemoth ships sunk-cloaked across the systems, looking like space itself shattered like dropped glass. Their previously harried smaller ships almost woke up, as if from slumber, and outpaced and outran our own interceptors, and moved the he behemoths to disable our ships. At least, what we were able to recover from a few ships functional enough to flee to hyperspace. Despite their apparent escape of our more agile survivor ships, they were followed and hunted like prey until they managed to flee past humanity's borders which should have been impossible with drive scientists and engineers everywhere agreeing that each ship that enters hyperspace enters their own almost dimension, unless physically tethered together would be separated during transit. But our survivors were not chased by the vastly more agile small human ships. They were all chased by a singular behemoth ship, despite the light years of distance that was going between our survivors. The behemoths were chasing them all at exactly the same moment and simply forcing its way through the energized plasma of hyperspace to pursue them, broadcasting nothing and not even gloating when it atomized a few of the survivors. Just silently chasing us with only the ship's name lit up by the harsh bright lights against the black of its hull. Erblat stopped speaking at this point and appeared to be steering itself for the next part. Body language software threw up a few tentative guesses to his emotions while he breathed thousands of years in the past. Fear, shame, and reluctance were the highest possibilities thrown up. You asked for it was the name of the behemoth when translated from human script to our own. And it was right. We did ask for it. My fleets were hopelessly outmatched against the humans. Entire formations reduced in the blink of an eye to a fine dust even with shields up and at full integrity, did nothing to stop them. When my captains realized this, they were perhaps outraged and decided to commit the third and fourth greatest mistake against humanity. Oblat took a steadying breath, eyes lost in thought as he began to continue again. Some of the captains decided to capitalize on the small holes punctured through the human shields and began death runs turning their entire vessels into ramming weapons and setting course for any opportunity that presented itself. Both military and civilian targets were chosen without a care for the consequences. Ships from my fleet, from fighters to frigates to large carriers, accelerated towards their chosen targets, their frames liquefying from the stress and heat generated by engines forced far beyond their designed outputs, yet still accelerating towards their targets, 
and steaming incandescent metal to the void as they did. The military targets fared well, with only a few being struck by my ships that managed to hold together enough through the defenses of their now unlocked stations, yet achieved little bar scratching the paint in the hulls. The civilian targets fared far worse, having been wiped off the surface of the planet by impacts similar in magnitude to a 7th Dreschap 5km asteroid strike due to the velocities involved. This was a third great mistake of mine and my species blindly followed me in committing more of the same by targeting their population centers. The fourth great mistake was thanks to the handful of ship engineers, perhaps fevered in the knowledge of their impending deaths aboard the death-run ships, decided to bathe themselves and flood the decks in an already supercritical engine couldn't. Whether they wanted to die by their own hands or the minds were broken from the stress, I will never know. But the after effects were pronounced as the chemical structure of the coolant was altered by temperature becoming supercritical. It became highly corrosive to carbon. My people are what the humans call silicon-based life. So while the corrosive properties did little to us, bar simply melting us and the ship thanks to heat, they were devastating towards humanity and the terraformed life on their planets. Once the coolant was released, either intentionally before impact or was vaporized by the impact, it was released into the atmosphere. And within hours, all life on that planet, Greta's harvest, if I'm correct, was destroyed with withered to nothing. This was the fourth mistake we committed against humanity either accidentally or deliberately by our forces that began to dump canisters of supercritical coolant on humanity's other worlds after witnessing the power of such improvised weapons. Still, the mistake was made. We began to commit chemical warfare, Oblat said after a few seconds, fear visibly making him shiver as the third video file ended. Grack opened the fourth file despite the protests and obvious fear from his crew. The video started with Erblat staring at the camera, visibly in worse condition than in the previous recording, as indicated by the shriveled appearance and missing scales. Erblat started with a shaky sigh and looked down briefly before finally starting to speak. Whoever you are, you may be wondering how I know so much details about what happened and why I refer to what some may consider typical warfare tactics as mistakes. So I will tell you how and why before I finish the task as Herald. Humanity, alongside their hidden martial prowess, are skilled and precise historians. If you have had the chance of meeting them, you would know this. They record everything, and while not using their technology often, they are skilled in hacking and taking data from other races' systems, with no one being any the wiser. This is why if you have been wondering your systems can even display these messages as well as understand me perfectly. As part of my task, they left me with a destroyed whole world, with my every recording they captured during our one-sided war. Every action and transgression that involved anything belonging to humanities correlated into information that was forced into my brain so that I would know my folly completely. So that I could better record these messages as a warning to all those who encounter it. Humanity follows what it calls the Geneva Conventions, that date back far into the past from planetary war before they were capable of accessing orbit. These conventions are their rules to warfare designed to prevent what they view as atrocities against themselves. These rules forbid certain types of warfare being engaged and were mutually agreed upon by the majority of their world's factions before unification and have been updated and maintained to still be relevant into their future. But when they were broken, firstly they will engage to attempt to stop the act and fall back on their imposed pacifism. But heed this warning as it was the doom of my species. Anger the humans enough and those Geneva Conventions become the Geneva Checklist, and for each further transgression their hostilities increases. This is not to say they become bloodthirsty killers one and all, some directly affected might, but they still as a whole excised undeserved restraint towards us. Not that we deserved it in the end. With that, the fourth file ended, leaving all aboard the fragger worried what the last would hold, and out of the morbid curiosity, Grack opened the fifth and final video. 
Oblat was from front and center, as is in the prior videos, and while he looked somehow worse for wear, he appeared almost relieved in a sense. Perhaps finishing these messages for the future were cathartic for him in a way, but the crew listened on to find out more. The human fleets came for our systems to at first try uh, to parlay with us, trying to prevent any unnecessary bloodshed on their part, and we refused them. My own fear and hubris ordering my remaining fleets and military forces to not communicate, and instead fire upon the humans as soon as they were spotted. Even now their response gives me chills despite centuries having passed. The only thing they broadcast was... Oblat took a shaky breath and stared directly into the camera. So be it. Oblat seemed to deflate in the recording and lose the last dregs of his energy ripping out from him with those three words. Within ten minutes, by their timescale, they had wiped out every periphery system we controlled, leaving just the system of our whole world left. We thought this impossible as one by one each system fell silent after their response was forcefully broadcast at once across every single data stream and sensor in those systems, leaving a dead silence after those three worlds. The humans, for some reason, left our home system be for a week by their time scale. I suspect so that the remaining population would notice and understand what had happened to their fellow Uradradish, their friends, family, Children and strangers, only connected by racial identity, were all gone. After that week, the human armada appeared perfectly at once, completely encapsulating the system with their behemoth ships and blocking out the very stars from view. The entire armada was completely motionless, with their drive seeming able to ignore the fundamental inertia that affects all ships in hyperspace. Only one ship had its transponder activated and broadcasting, and that singular ship out of half a million broadcast their demands for our surrender. This ship then sat there and waited for a reply from me, as I was the only one left holding any real authority for my people, and much of the blame. In my rage over the destruction of my species, I activated our last defense as a weapon to target that singular ship, broadcasting its name as Greta's Fury. This defense system was a system to locally molest space-time in a set area, slowing and speeding it up as a method to divert or block incoming attacks away from my system. A truly sophisticated system used for a crude purpose. I used it to accelerate the local time of my system's asteroid belt to cause those asteroids to collide with the human ships. And this was the fifth and final mistake against the humans. Temporal warfare is included in their Geneva Conventions, and within those rules it is by far the most strictly enforced, and the one with the most dire of consequences for those who engage in it. The only reaction from humanity was a change of name for that singular broadcasting name. The ship renamed itself to the apt, the gloves are off. The other ships did not even move to avoid collisions with the incoming asteroids and simply let them collide with their hulls and not leave a single mark. The gloves are off shot through every defense in my system, ignoring them with ease and stopped in the exact center of my system if you went by the orbits rather than the star. It fired only one weapon to a terrible yet total effect. That weapon broke reality within our system, and while I am not sure if every member of my species saw the same thing, but it is what I saw when that weapon fired. The world went dark, not even dark. It was as if existence simply ceased, and was replaced by an infinite expanse of shattered mirrors. I saw alternate paths I could have taken, and even those of my ancestors. I saw glimpses of myself greeting humans with open arms. I saw us fighting together against the common foe. I saw my people without the trappings of civilization, having never developed past crude stone tools. An entire different race, overtaking ours and being the dominant life form, and I even saw what my world would look like if that crucial spark of life never took off. Grack and his crew shared horrified glances at each other, terrified at what they had seen so far as the recording continued unstopped. 
While I was experiencing the possibilities of distant futures, pasts, and presents, the humans took advantage of the stopped time and simply abducted every single remaining member of my race and froze them, leaving me the single living member of my race at their mercy after taking their time to carefully prepare my punishment. They reduced every structure on the planet to dust with their weapons, save a small area around a former capital building, leaving nothing left. I don't know how, but they either removed my homeworld from the system and flung it into the void, or eradicated the system by the planet. I suppose it doesn't matter now what they did, and I will never know. I woke up in this habitation room, you see. I was recording and blinked what felt like spun glass out of my eyes when I saw my first human in front of me. They looked at me not with fear at my predatory appearance, fury at what I'd set in motion, or even glee of gloating. No, they stared at me with complete apathy as they told me to sit. This was how I was informed of my purpose and the fate of my people. I was told that my people were preserved in the future rather than being eradicated as I would have ordered in their place. I was told that some of my planets had unfrozen members, but they had carefully dropped chemical weapons that rather than destroy life, simply dissolving anything artificially made object and setting those planets to the Stone Age. I was told that depending on how those planets fared, then the rest of the population would be seated on other empty planets to develop naturally as well. Removed from the influences of our current history, culture, and my destroyed regimency, it was truthfully a relief that my people had not been wiped from existence and simply made not a threat and left relatively unharmed by the humans. There was a kindness that I would not have shown or ordered. I was then informed of why I had been left unfrozen or outrightly killed. I was to be the living scholar of my and the Empire's mistakes and record my findings so that future peoples would be able to study my mistakes and prevent the ire of humanity once more. I was left with the console, the full total of knowledge generated by this conflict, instructions on how to use this console want to record and finally nanites designed to artificially and forcefully extend my lifespan indefinitely. This was the first, and to my knowledge, only direct cruelty inflicted by humanity upon me. Not that I begrudged them for that, as they wanted to ensure that I had no choice but to learn from my mistakes in full. Learn why the reactions taken and to record a worthy warning for those who come after. Erblat looked like life was finally leaving the being. He already dealt scales turning ashen as he spoke to the camera, eyes clouding with cataracts. The humans ensured that only once the message they deem acceptable had been recorded, then the nanites would cease their work. And as you may see, I have finished my work, so I can now finally rest. After living a thousand cycles surrounded by the remains of my world and the interstellar void. Noeblatt's clouded eyes focused for the last time on the camera as he began to slump forward on the chair, uttering the final sentence and plea of the video. Please, I don't know who you are, or even if it was for nothing, but if you have watched these messages sent into the dark, then please learn from my mistakes, and if humanity still exists, do not anger them! With his final plea uttered, all strength left Erblat's body, and his head began to fall forwards, clouded wisps of life already having left his eyes before his head dropped to the desk, ending the recording and leaving his body in the exact same position as they found his desiccated corpse 8,000 cycles later. With a trembling voice, Grack ordered his helmsman to set course for the nearest communication relay to pass on the lesson and plea that he and his crew had witnessed summed succinctly up as don't feck with humanity end of story i'd quickly like to thank the t5 channel members and patrons caspar arnholtz cam maxwell lord Azrakal, dragzoon wre ollie's sister ambrose could and quantum wednesday thank you very much